So welcome back to the ZZ Mill Show. How's everybody doing? Um, I have a special guest today. So basically, you know, I'm always talking about the impact that music has on us as a people, whether that be adults or young children. And I also, you know, I'm talking about drill. I say that I think that drill is not the best music for young people to listen to because it incites certain type of behavior. I want to just be clear. I'm not saying it's the cause of whatever's happening on the roads or whatever, but it does have an influence and it incites violence, I believe. So I thought instead of always going back and forth with people and pretending like I know everything, because obviously I don't and everyone in the comments definitely doesn't, I thought why not have somebody on the show that is well versed in this. So today we have Mary. Hi. Hi, Zizi. How are thanks. you? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming. <laughs> You're looking lovely. Thank you. Thank you. How's, um, how's life treating you? How's quarantine, lockdown, all of the above? Oh, my. Where do we start? <laughs> <laughs> it is. Um, it's OK. I mean, obviously, we're all quite worried about going out and doing things, but I think it, it's been OK. It's been OK. We're getting used to it. It's our right. kind of new normal, isn't it? I so. know. Do you know, I saw Strange. a tweet the other day. And it was like, it's so it's mad that our new normal is us getting excited about being in tier three. Like mm. us, the possibility of going to tier three, we're like, oh, I can't wait for tier three because yes. we get to go out. That's that's. I thought that was quite funny. Yeah. Anyway, so give me, give the audience just a breakdown of um, who you are, what you do, and mm. um, your background. Like, yeah. Okay, so I'm a clinical psychologist. Well, I should say I work as a clinical psychologist, okay. and I work in the NHS, but I also run an independent organisation that helps to make ways for people who cannot access or who may have stigma around accessing therapeutic support. Okay. Um, and it's called Making Ways. Okay. Um, so I've worked with a whole kind of um, diverse clinical, other clinical psychologists as well. Okay. Um, so in terms of how much you want me to say about my background, so in terms of clinically, I work with people who are, have kind of neurological difficulties, but um, all conditions, um, but also work with people experiencing mental health okay. challenges as well. So right. there's a whole range of... <laughs> and how long did you have to study for um, all of this? Like, what's the time frame? Because we were talking before we started and mm -hmm. some of the stuff that you were saying, I was just like, how do you even remember? I don't even remember where sometimes I put my phone in the house, let mm -hmm. alone like the stuff that you were saying. So are you constantly learning or how does it work? I think I'm constantly learning. We okay. have to constantly learn because obviously we're helping people to help manage difficult situations in their life. Mm -hmm. um, but I've been studying for ages and I think, I think in the field of clinical psychology, I started, well, I studied um, psychology at A-levels okay. so, and then did it for my undergraduate degree, so my okay. BSc, mm -hmm. and then did a master's in psychology and obviously then moved on to doing a doctorate okay. in, in clinical psychology. And within that time, I've worked with people presenting with anxiety, depression, postnatal depression, PTSD, mm -hmm. um, and as I said, brain injury. So there's a whole range of people I've worked with. I've had okay. kind of privilege and opportunity to work with. So it is a long time. So yeah. I'd probably say, gosh, I don't want to give my age away, so I won't <laughs> even tell you how long it's been, but definitely, definitely in terms of how long I've been studying psychology from A-levels to now, oh, wow. yeah. it's probably been 15 years plus. Wow. So it is a, it's been ages, yeah. Wow. So I'm glad that we've, we've cleared that up. So yeah. we've got more than a qualified person sitting with us mm. to talk about this subject. Cause that's one thing I wanted to be sure on that um, whoever we had was somebody that was well versed in it. And that mm -hmm. is, um, yeah, it's knowledgeable in the subject. You get what I mean? Mm -hmm. So as I said, um, I constantly have this debate about the impact that music has on um, us mm -hmm. as adults. Because I think a lot of people think that once you get to like, I don't know, 20 or 18 or something, all of a sudden your mind and your brain becomes strong enough that music is never going to influence you anyhow whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So us as adults and us also as children, mm -hmm. or, or not us as children, as children as well, mm -hmm. um, I constantly go back and forth with people online just about the influence that, the influence that certain types of genre mm -hmm. have on us. Mm -hmm. So like drill, or even just the fact that now we are, I feel like we're over-sexualizing ourselves when it comes to music. There's a lot of sexual content mm -hmm. in music, how mm -hmm. that maybe affects um, how men see women, how women see themselves. Um, mm -hmm. Speak to me about how music affects us. 
Okay. So that is a big subject, Zizi, I think, actually. <laughs> no, I know, I know. I didn't know how to, like, just, yeah, but yeah. Yeah, but I think you've made some really important points there because you've talked about actually how music affects our behaviour. Right, okay. And you talked about actually people might listen to drill yeah. and probably might um, display some violence or might probably take in what the drill music is, is probably um, how they appraise it or how they're interpre inter interpreting the music that they're listening to and mm -hmm. how they might apply it to their lives. Right. But I'll take a little bit back. Yes, you know, please. Okay. A little bit back yeah. to how music starts when we think about children before mm -hmm. even they're born. Mm -hmm. And I remember what I was saying to you before, when you think about music, when a child, um, when you're, when a pregnant woman, because I have, I have two little children, and I remember when I was pregnant with my first baby, as I was saying to you before, um, at, the, at 24 weeks, um, my husband's a musician, so he plays music. Mm -hmm. Every time he played that music, my baby would move, mm -hmm. right? And that is because his hearing has started to develop. And there's research to back this up, mm -hmm. because that's to say that actually the rhythm and the beat and everything else, the child takes it in. Right. So the, actually music is beyond the content. All the kind of tonation, how the, how the arrangements are made, are, are set up in a way that can influence us. Right. So for me, when we think about actually drill, can compare, if, you, if you watch a video, still video, and you watch the video without music, right. it might evoke a different type of emotions out of you or different kind of thought process, processes. But if you, if you were to watch the same video mm -hmm. and it had maybe, let's say, classical music, doo -doo 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 -doo, whatever yeah. it is, you might, it might evoke a different type of thinking and emotions. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you play a music that is upbeat, up-tempo, there's a different type of excitement mm -hmm. that comes up for us. And that is because music really what happens interacts with a part of our brain that evokes emotion. Right, okay. So there are different parts of our brain. So if you think about it, if, if you listen to, give me one of your favorite music. So. I like old school R&B. Okay. So like Monica. Um, uh, I don't want to give it okay. I can't remember how, uh, you know, Monica, that's, why does it go out of my head like that? How was that song? Don't take it personal, you know? Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. like, yeah. So you're saying you like um, Don't Take It Personal. Yeah. Tell me, when you think about Don't Take It Personal, when this song comes up, yeah. what do you think? It just, it brings me back to a time, I don't know, it just makes me feel like school days. Mm. And when I first heard it, like Monica and the style in the video mm -hmm. and that just like laid back feeling, like you just bob your head to mm -hmm. it, just makes you feel warm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the kind of feeling that it gives me, yeah. So kind of warm feeling takes you back to the school day. So what that is doing there is because what's happened, your memory is kind of coded. Right, okay. When you heard that music, because music actually feeds into the bits of our memory that we tend to call hippocampus. So the part is all part of, of, of the brain. Okay. So it kind of, it has been coded. Right. And what it has done is kind of connected with how you're feeling. So the kind of emotion that it evokes, which is the amygdala, the part of the brain that is sat right underneath the hippocampus. So then okay. it evokes that emotion. So what you're describing there, that warm feeling, but almost kind of, I don't know, that relaxed feeling. I don't know, maybe there might be some kind of excitement there and probably what you might then start to do, you might start to move with it. Right. That is the power of music on our cognition. Okay. So what that is doing is interacting with the way in which you're thinking, right. the way in which you're feeling and what it is that you're doing. Mm -hmm. And that is drill music. Okay. Right. So for example, you might hear drill music right. and you might think, okay, Depending on your context, though, you, you might hear drill music and you might associate it with a certain time where you're with your peers. Right. And what you might be doing there. Okay. And so if that is exciting, that memory is triggered, there might be a thought that would come up for you. Mm -hmm. And if that thought comes up, there might be a feeling that would come up. It could be maybe someone said something, feeling of frustration. Mm -hmm. And if you recognise or if you can relate or the, the lyrics of the music resonates with you, mm -hmm. you might just think, actually, you know what? I'm thinking this, I'm feeling this, what, what can we do about it? Right. So do, do the, lyrics and the, the lyrics and the beat go hand in hand? In terms of the lyrics and the beat, if yeah. you think about the beat itself, so right. beats are quite historically, before language developed language, beats were there. Right. Beats evoke some kind of emotion. So I'll give you an example. There was a study done with rats. A okay. lot, of our, lot of our psychology, some of our psychology studies are done with animals. And within that study, what they did, they played a beat mm -hmm. um, without, with a similar lyrics but the beat was different mm -hmm. so it was much more of a slower beat right the rats that heard that beat linked with the same lyric were not moving as much but the rats that heard 
the kind of up-tempo, so kind of rock music. Yeah. You can see that we're all running around in the little cage. Right, okay. So it is evoking the, ang the, the kind of feeling of doing something, the excitement right, okay. of whether it makes you want to do something else. So they, they're jumping up. So it's interesting because a lot of people think that the lyrics alone is what evokes that behavior. Right. But the beat itself can also be linked with Right. The behavior, how the brain is, is, is excited or wh which part of the brain it excites. So that is a study that you can perhaps look at. But then that can relate to even if you think about church, right? Okay. So if you think about people who go to church which with app temper music, mm -hmm. right? The context may, may, may produce a different behavior, but the action of excitement and movement isn't mm -hmm. so different because that tempo of the music excites something else. That means you need to move, you need to get excited. Whereas when they listen to very slow tempo music, there's something else that right. is soothing about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so the, the beat is quite, the, how the music, music is arranged is quite important. Mm -hmm. But where the language comes up is when we think about the content as the language, isn't it? When we think about actually, as a child develops, um, oftentimes as a mother, you might just cuckoo, you might just probably do a bit of rhythmic. How you communicate with a child might be to do with kind of rhythm. So okay. if we going to eat, da, 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 so you might just do that yeah, kind of, because yeah. they, the tempo is, what they what they what they work what the baby's working with right okay. so that can be soothing but from the age of two they might then start to develop the language right. they don't have they don't quite have the comprehension yet mm. but they might just start to pick up the words so my child if i'm to play they might have listened to let's say a song mm -hmm. um twinkle twinkle little stars for, for instance they might not know the lyrics but for, for example if then they are two they might just start to repeat the words they don't they don't know the meaning right okay but when they get to the age of three they start to then think about actually how do I problem solve this meaning making thing and so they start to have something we call there's a gentleman called um, Vygotsky so okay. I'm thinking about developmentally so how do I actually make sense of problem solve this this whole social thing that I've learned and so when they start to problem solve they start to attach meaning to it so right. this guy called Vygotsky he was a um, Russian clinical psychologist and researcher um, from 1920s he would say that at the age of three what the external language a child would have, would have had, they would then now have private languages with them, private conversations with themselves. That's a private language. Right. Okay. So they start to talk to themselves. Actually, maybe if it's music, oh, I've heard this person say this. How am I making sense of it? Okay. And from the age of three. From the age of three, it's his. It's his so take when on people it. say, "Oh, I can play certain songs in my car," my mm. child doesn't know exactly what's going on. Yeah, it, I might. It might have swearing in it. It might have sexual reference in it, etc., yeah. etc. Et because even I, when I say stuff, I, like when I was younger, and I used to listen to like Spice Girls, yeah. and the con and the lyrics would be like, "To become one, I need some loving, like I've never needed love before." Like mm. all those things, mm. I was singing along to it. So, are you saying at that age, I was still trying to? Even though I don't remember trying to figure it out, I was yes. figured, trying to figure out what it was, what it meant. Because your brain is still working at that age. Right. Okay. Your brain is still coding. Your brain is still taking on information. So you're, when you get to three, what you're thinking, you're, you're just taking in the words, and you're starting to have that private conversation. You might have it out loud. So there's difference. This private conversation is in the conversation. So I'll come back to that in a moment. But what you're then doing, you're thinking actually. Okay, I've been given this information. So Vygotsky would say that we are, our cognition is shaped, shaped by our social environment. And okay. music is part of our culture and our social kind of environment as well. So social cultural environment and music is a part of it. Right. So if you think about music being a part of our social cultural environment, shaping our cognition, if a child is at three trying to problem solve maybe a lyric. So for example, give an example of my children. Um, they would have been listening to Peppa Pig. Peppa Pig, it would come up. So it's a bit of, it's like shark. What's that one? Baby shark. Baby shark. That's it. Because people were saying it. there was something in that crack, like in the song. Were they? <laughs> oh what. well, that's news to me. Because <laughs> you know, all the kids were just literally like, they go crazy. Is that mm -hmm. such a good example? Because baby shark and yeah. all they kids get addicted to those songs. Dopamine. Dopamine. That's a part of our brain. But that is an important point you've made because. If you think about my little ones, right, they might be listening to Baby Shark or, yeah. or, or Peppa Pig um, theme song. And what happens is that my two-year-old would repeat the Peppa Pig. Yeah. However, my five-year-old would understand a bit more right. of the me, okay, problem solved, okay, Peppa Pig does this and that's that, and they sing the song and they go, Hunk, whatever they yeah. do, or Baby Shark and baby, the, the baby move. And so he would have a private conversation with himself to regulate how he's thinking, what right, he's okay. thinking, what is going on. 
but that is the music. Whereas my two-year-old would just verbalise it. So this okay. is different. So a child verbalising it doesn't mean that it's all lost. They verbalise and it's done. It means that at some stage, when that music is repeated, they mm. would want to make sense of it. Right, okay. And the bit that I think you're interested in is the bit where they start to internalise that, isn't it? Yes. It sounds like the bit that you're yeah, interested yeah, in. Yeah, yeah, that's the bit, yeah. Yeah. So what this guy called the Gospels say, from around, 70, around 10, we start to have an internal language. Right, okay. And the difference between the internal language is that it makes us regulate our, how we feel inside, how we're making sense, we regulate, so we use an internal language. And what he would say is that that's the bit where language and thought and cognition begin to align. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if we hear a music, whatever we hear, that language in the music might become our thought. And if we think of a certain thing, that might then become our language. Right. So then the, the, there is now an interchange between language and thought. And that's when we start to internalise our inner, some people call it inner kind of thought processes, which may not be communicated, but there's a process that's come about where we start to internalise things. And do we ever grow out of that? Like, as we get older, do we not do that anymore? I think we grow with that. Okay. Right. Yeah, I don't think we, we start to grow out of, people assume that we will grow out of the private conversations we have with ourselves. Just like we don't grow out of our external, the way in which we're communicating, right. we might sometimes need a private conversation, but developmentally, we've developed to have our inner thoughts, our inner conversations and our outer thought. So all of this is happening. Mm -hmm. What effect then does uh, the environment have? Because that's another another thing that people always go back to. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the people that listen to, I'm not just going to concentrate on drill, but like say any sort of music that is a bit violent or mm -hmm. evokes some sort of emotion mm -hmm. that, you know, it's going to be predominantly white kids that might listen to a mm -hmm. rapper so because mm -hmm. they those are the ones that go to the concerts and they're going to buy the tickets etc mm -hmm. etc mm -hmm. um like i had a, a a guy on my show and he said that like there was nothing wrong with what he was doing because the m people that come to the show are predominantly white mm -hmm. and so it's not affecting them because they don't live in the hood do you mm -hmm. get what i mean mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. what effect does the environment have where's the the correlation there Okay, so that's a very good point, and I'll come back. I'll go back to this guy that I was talking about, Vygotsky. But what, what there are two key points that he makes in terms of the knowledgeable other, right? Okay. And what by what I mean by knowledgeable other, it doesn't mean that actually, as a child, there are people around you who know quite a lot, right? And you might start to learn from them, right? And it doesn't just sit with your parents. It doesn't just sit with your teachers. It doesn't just sit with um, you know your brothers and sisters. That could also sit with your peers, but that could also sit with music. Exactly. I, lit I say this, and every when I say this, people mm. are saying, oh, it's up to the parents. The parents, if you've got good upbringing, mm. then yeah. it do you, the music's not going to influence you. It's all to do with your upbringing. It's all to and I'm yes. like, no, how is that possible? Because yes. I, growing up, I probably spent more time at school than I did with my mum. And yeah. as I get older, that lessens because I'm going out now and mm. I'm on the, in especially now with the internet. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Kids don't even talk to their parents at the table anymore. They're on their iPads or their whatever. Mm. So I've said this before and people are like, no, it's all to do with the parenting. But you're saying, no, there's so many external there's factors. so many external factors. Because if it's just to do with the parenting, how comes our parents would not know pal? You know, mm. because we are learning from multiple sources. Yeah. So we're not, it's parenting, yes, there is a, there's a role there. But there are other knowledgeable others in our lives that would influence us. And right. that includes music. Because... Mm -hmm. Whoever's singing that song or that rap or whatever is your knowledgeable other because they have that knowledge in that area that is starting to influence how your cognition works. Right. Right. And I think the bit where people can have an argument around parents is that um, the other side of it is that proximity matters. Okay. So how close and how far the person is, is in, in relation to where you are. So yeah, parents may be close, yeah. but also so is that music that you're listening to on that voice is also quite close. Mm -hmm. So proximity isn't so far away. And I think that's where you make a valid point in terms of thinking actually, yes, there's parental role here because they live with the person, but half of the time your parents are working. Exactly. How, what are you using to regulate that emotion? Oftentimes you might play music, you might play lyric, you might mm -hmm. play a song. So you're using that content sometimes to regulate how you feel when that that primary figure doesn't have to be the knowledgeable other, 
isn't around. There are other bits you can, you can get that knowledge from. So as a parent, because I'm, this is another thing, like whenever I speak, it's like, you're not, you don't have no kids, like mm -hmm. you have no, you can't speak on this subject. But as a parent, how do you kind of monitor what your children, what do you think is okay for your children to listen to? Mm, okay, that is a good question. That is a good question. <laughs> I'm not going to sit here and lie about not listening to all the other songs, <laughs> all the other music. But I think actually um, age appropriate music is important because mm -hmm. children are still, they still have brain, they're still coding, their memories still, the memories are working, the emotions are all flying around. It's, it's trying to regulate everything. So for me, I think that having age appropriate music around children is important. Mm -hmm. As they get older and yeah. get to a teenage age where they want to implement what it is that they hear, uh, without you... So is that the next stage now? That's the next stage. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, so we've, in, okay, right. Mm, mm. So we've gone past the age of 10 where they started to internalise the language. So once they internalise, that's why teenagers sometimes would probably switch off from their parents because they're having this whole internal um, stuff going on that they're trying to regulate and figure out. Yeah. But if you're privy to what your child might be listening to, I would say that there's a different role that you start to play and that comes in, into communication and conversations. Okay. So you can't minimise... Um, the, the, the role that this music or the knowledgeable other plays in the child's life. So I think it's like the, the, right, the right children appropriate music. I wouldn't, I mean, going back to the having a three year old listen to Cardi um, B. Yeah. WAP. Yes, yes. <laughs> I, I wouldn't have the three year old listen to that because what is happening there is that the three year old is going to, even if, let's, let's forget the brain for now, yeah. they're going to verbalize the content somewhere. Right. Because children are coding. They just pick on what you say. My child repeats what I say. If I say go, they say go. If, if, so if they're listening to that lyric, a two-year-old, three-year-old is going to pick up that lyric and repeat it. Mm. When they get to the age of having private conversation and they hear that music again, they're going to start having this problem-solving thing of what is going on here. What is WAP? What is WAP? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So then what was you... So... It, you internalise it and then you said the intentions, is that what you just said before? About the actions? It, yes. So when you get to the teenage years, then what happens, did you say? So when you get to the teenage years, you might probably want to implement. Oh, right, yeah, that's it, implement. Yeah. So then that's where, you're, that's where I guess, when you hear certain lyrics, mm -hmm. you might then want to implement those certain yeah. lyrics in your life and are you saying act them out? Yeah. Okay, yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. And I think kind of saying a little bit about that because... It's interesting because obviously those lyrics have become your, sometimes for some people they're go-to because all the other, if we think about contextually as well, yeah, they may not have anywhere else they can actually seek refuge. A lot of us seek refuge in, in music, you know, songs do require a lot for most of us because it's, the emotions and the memories it excites can be positive, but it can also be negative anyway. Yeah. So they would then obviously listen to that language and find ways of actually oh, okay this is my knowledgeable other they're giving me knowledge in it could be a array of things sex it could be um you know i don't know friendships love mm. relationship it could be a whole range of things they're giving me that knowledge in these areas of stuff and so that that then becomes a knowledgeable other right okay. you start to actually think okay when you listen to that music i think this way and when i think this way i feel this way when i listen to maybe um, brandy or something, I might feel, I might think, oh, that's, 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 that's a beautiful fairy tale song she might be playing. Mm. And I might feel like, oh, I want to be loved. And then you probably might probably act on that by acting a certain way. When you listen to Drill, you might think, oh, okay, now, yeah, I'm a man's man. Or we mm -hmm. might have certain thoughts yeah. that would then evoke a certain type of emotion and then a behaviour. So, yeah. so when your class is an adult, as we get older and we experience more stuff, do we then have more control over our, our mental, over our brain? Or is that again to do with the environments that we're in, the type mm. of people that we're around? Mm -mm. I think as you get older, you would have quite hopefully learned a lot about life and how to regulate different parts of yourself. Right. So, um, yes, you may be influenced by some context, but not to a greater extent as you would do when you're little. Right, okay. Because obviously what you will then have as you get older is something we call um, schema, right? So that is something that, for example, things that happened earlier on in your life shape the way in which you view the world around you. Okay. Or others, or even yourself, mm -hmm. right? 
So you have that, you have that earlier experience to tap into, to think, okay, when I'm in this situation, what can I do, what might I do, and how might I behave? What do you think is the best music to listen to? <laughs> That's an important point. Was, I can't give advice on that. <laughs> what, do you, what, do you, what is the best type of music for, mm. like, for your brain, for your brain to, to, mm -hmm. to, to evolve? Mm -hmm. and make from, I guess for children, like, to, what would you say is the best type of music for them to listen to? That's a good question because it's interesting because I was reading some research recently and it talked about classical music. Right, okay. Um, helping children develop cognitively, like, for example, in maths and in different academic um, um, subjects. Whereas, kind of, it's interesting, they referenced, uh, they referenced actually Adele, actually, which is oh, quite they? interesting. Oh, okay. That, obviously, that kind of, um, other pop music, I think there's pop music that we're kind of trying to make a reference to, doesn't excite that same high level of cognitive functioning as classical music will do. Okay, and right. it's interesting that obviously sometimes when you go to certain types of households, um, people might have their children learning piano from an mm -hmm. earlier age. And again, that helps with um, cognition as well. So that kind of links with the classical music. Um, I'm not saying forgo all music because I listen to all types yeah, of music. Yeah, yeah. But I think if we're thinking about research and what they might probably advise in terms of thinking and cognition and development, um, that is what they would say classical music. Do you think, I don't know if this is um, in, if you're going to um, have an opinion on this, but do you think there's a reason why certain types of music is pushed on certain types of communities? Mm. Do you think that there is, knowing like all you know about how impactful certain music and how the brain works and how the brain reacts to music, mm -hmm. do you think there's a reason why, you know, uh, record labels push, you know, over sexualized music mm. now and, and violent music and you know do you think there's a, a reason behind it it's interesting you ask that i can't tell you the reason behind why they're pushing that but obviously it's clearly good marketing because obviously it's good if they if people are over sexualized so if you think about the visual mm. if you see an over sexualized person and if you think about actually developmentally as in age wise so a lot of teenagers are still discovering almost maybe their sexual identities or, or, or intimacy or how to function relationship in relationships. Mm. So oftentimes you'd find that people around, even in early early 20s, you're still trying to do that. Right, yeah. Even goes into our 30s, mm -hmm. you're still figuring out what this is all, it's all about, this whole thing. And obviously in terms of when people see sex, there's something it does to your thinking and there's something that it makes you feel. Mm. And and when we think about music, when, when I was talking to you earlier about how music can also excite the part of our brain, um, addictive um, behaviours such as sex and, and um, maybe eating chocolate might, ex might excite. When people see that sexual representation, I wonder whether that bit of that brain, that dopamine, that bit of that brain gets excited a little bit. Right, okay. And yeah. they, then they want to perhaps um, reenact what they might be seeing what they might be doing or how they might probably have some ideas for themselves. So I wonder whether there's something around sexualizing something and which um, and how that may excite not just the emotional part of it, but the bit of the brain that actually can be addictive to something. Right, okay. Just like people might be addictive to watching um, porn on, okay. the, yeah, on TV. So it can excite that. So I wonder whether that kind of visual association with that music then stays in people's mind longer. Okay. And then that's when we get bust it down challenge. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. I feel like I'm so glad because I wish you could talk a bit longer, but we have to um, wrap up. But mm. you've obviously said so much great stuff and um, I hope people actually listen and not be, because I think sometimes automatically we go on the defense of mm. no, this can never affect me. Music mm. can never this when it's, we all know that we use music to, um, set even set atmospheres like even mm. like you said with sex like some people put slow jams on you're not mm. going to listen to um, rock music f for sex with some people but majority of people are going to mm. put you know nice soothing music on mm. Valentine's Day you're going to put nice slow jams on in the back etc so I just think it's weird when people are kind of in denial about mm. the impact and the mood that music can set do you know what I mean yeah. um, have you got like what would your final your final thoughts be when it comes to like the impact that music has on people in general, but especially like young kids and, you know. Yeah. 
Well, my final thoughts would be that music does have an it, we, it will have an influence um, one way or one other. Yeah. And we, if we think about how humans began or primitive days, rhythm was there, movement was uh, we had movement. You know, yeah. we had music even w without the language to allow people to to survive, to allow people to get through situations, to allow people to regulate themselves, regulate emotions. When you think about even um, historical um, stuff like slavery, people use music to get through that pain. Yeah. So music has an influence hugely on both children and adults alike, but also it can transcend into generations and generations and generations over time. So it is a powerful um, tool. Yeah. It's a powerful, knowledgeable other. And I think it's important for us to bear that in mind. I like the way you said the power. I, I think one thing I'm going to take away from today is the powerful, knowledgeable other. Yeah. Um, because I think that's what people kind of are in the clouds with that. Mm -hmm. You can choose, only your parents can um, raise you or mm -hmm. give you influence and whatever, but so much of the outside world can do that. Yeah. And I think that's one thing that we are in denial about a lot. Um, but they're telling me I have to wrap up, which I'm so annoyed about. Um, mm. Just can you tell people where they can find you, um, your practice, just give us all that information if you if you want to. Okay, yeah, yeah. that's absolutely fine. Well, I'm on Instagram now. That's <laughs> the new page, I'll set to you. Um, and it's Dr. Mary A. Okay. Um, so you can find me at that. Um, also, we're called Making Ways. Mm -hmm. And you can find us on makingways.co.uk if you search for us okay. um, yes and if you follow me on Instagram you probably might then get a Twitter link when, when I create one but yes, yes. yes. so yeah I'm on, I'm on the platforms now so wicked that's me really thank you so much yes. thank you for coming on the show and sharing your knowledge absolutely mm -hmm. amazing guys you know what to do like subscribe share with your friends especially this one and your family we out I was going to say gang gang but I don't think it's impression I don't think it's the right impression to leave on people after we've heard about What's the word? Other knowledgeable? Knowledgeable other. Knowledgeable <laughs> other. I don't want to influence gang culture. We out. <laughs> yeah, okay. Thank you. Thanks. Peace.